you. Um, welcome, everybody. My name is Joe Hadamio. I'm a senior attorney at Housing and Economic Rights Advocates, and I'm joined by my colleague, Faviana Schechtman, who will be monitoring the questions and answers uh, chat box. And we are doing this presentation in coordination with the Sacramento Law Library. Thank you very much <laughs> to the Law Library for um, this collaboration. We will be talking today about debt and credit, how to access and read your credit report, tips on how to try to improve your credit score, and also how to deal with debt collection. So um, the chat box is not going to be um, available to participants in this uh, workshop, but you will be able to type questions into the Q&A box as you listen to this presentation. And Fabiana will be monitoring that um, to alert me to questions as they come up um, that we can review. And um, we'll take note of those and address those at the end of the presentation. And again, this is a collaboration between the Sacramento County Public Law Library and Housing and Economic Rights Advocates, uh, which is an organization that I work for that uh, provides um, advice and counsel and uh, advocacy for consumers who face debt and credit issues, particularly low and moderate income consumers. And just as a disclaimer, this presentation is for informational purposes only. It's not creating an attorney-client relationship uh, between the participants and either the Public Law Library of Sacramento County or Housing and Economic Rights Advocates, or HERA, as we call it for short. And more information on additional resources will uh, be provided at the end of this presentation. Let's start with talking about your credit report and understanding what actually gets reported on that, what it is and how you can access it. So only credit accounts and items related to credit get reported on your credit report. And to distinguish uh, credit from other types of accounts, um, credit is basically money that you were using or funds that you were using to spend in advance and then to pay back later to another party, such as a credit card company <clears throat> or a lender. Um, so keep that in mind that there are other accounts that you have probably, such as bank accounts, um, utility accounts, and those are not gonna get reported on your credit report, even though they may show that you're a responsible consumer by paying those off by not getting overdrafts. But if you look on the left-hand side of this slide, the things that are reported on your credit report include um, your name and other names that may have been used by you, uh, addresses where you've uh, lived at, phone numbers, and past employers. Credit card accounts will be reported, different types of loans, such as student loans, auto loans, home, home loans, mortgages, Accounts that end up in collection will also be reported. That's an instance where it might not have in initially been a credit account. It might have been like a cell phone account or a cable bill. But when it ends up in collections because you've fallen behind and not cured the default, those when the collections accounts themselves will get reported on your credit report. Judgments um, such as debt collection judgments or evictions judgments can also be reported on your credit report and other public records. Um, for example, um, in some credit reports, there are some credit reports that are tailored um, for background checks or for uh, tenant screening, and those might report arrests and convictions as well. And then inquiries are reported. An inquiry is basically um, when a, uh, a, a creditor or a lender or somebody who uh, wants to check out your credit um, history can access your credit report and, and usually it can come up in one of two ways. 
a soft inquiry is um, where someone is doing it to see if they want to make you an offer that you haven't applied for. So it might just be, you know, like Wells Fargo Bank is doing some promotional marketing and they want to find consumers with a certain credit profile. They may do a soft inquiry um, on your account, or you may be um, trying to be pre-qualified for a loan where you're not actually submitting an application, but you're probing whether you will even be in the ballpark uh, for the type of interest rate that you want, the type of loan that you want. Those are soft inquiries. Those generally do not affect your credit score. Hard inquiries, by contrast, are where you're actually applying for a loan or for a credit card or some other credit account. And those uh, will have an impact on your credit score and your credit report um, to the extent that you are doing a number of a number of hard inquiries appear on your report in a short period of time. Generally, if it's if you have three or more hard inquiries within a short period of time, that could start to affect your credit score negatively. Um, creditors uh, sometimes interpret that that as you sort of being desperate to get a loan and not being able to get one, and they will count that the the credit. Um, reporting agencies that come up with credit scores uh, will often lower your score because of that. Now, those are things that get reported. The things that you might think get reported but do not get reported um, are accounts such as checkings, checking or savings card payments that you make, um, or checking or savings accounts that you have um, and that you keep responsibly or not, that, that's not gonna get reported on, on the credit report because it's not considered credit. That's that's your money um, that, that, that you're, you're spending or saving. Utility bill payments, such as electricity and gas, cable, phone, those, those accounts will not get reported either. Rent payments do not get reported and prepaid cards do not get reported. So it's important to distinguish um, these things uh, particularly if you're trying to um, improve your credit, you want to um, try to have accounts that are going to get reported because that's the only way to improve your credit score is to have a good credit history on accounts that do get reported. And just to note that um, negative items on the accounts that do get reported will generally stay on your on your credit report for seven years. One exception is bankruptcy, and that will stay on for 10 years. Credit reports can impact your financial options, um, as, as you probably already know. Um, they matter when you're applying for loans and credit cards because the banks and other lenders will um, access your credit report to decide if they want to give you a loan and to determine what interest rate to give you. So the higher and better your credit score and credit report, the, uh, the lower the interest rate uh, you, you will generally be offered. Landlords may also use the credit report to decide if they want to rent an apartment to you. Um, insurance companies will use the report to determine whether to give you insurance coverage and the rates that you'll pay. And also in some cases, employers uh, can use credit reports uh, in very limited circumstances. Um, typically when you're applying for a job that involves um, sensitive financial information or access to people's social security numbers uh, or also uh, government agency jobs. And so th it's very limited, but if it does happen, they're required to provide a copy of the report to you if they used it in considering your application. But the bottom line is a good credit report uh, can save you money and open up opportunities whereas a bad credit report can cost you more money and, and close off those opportunities. So the credit report basically, um, or I'm sorry, a credit score will summarize what's in your credit report by giving it a, you know, a number generally between uh, you know, up to 800. And there's two different scoring models that the credit reporting agencies use. One is called FICO and the other is called Vantage. Um, there, the factors that are involved in each of those are proprietary, so we don't know exactly how much weight is given uh, uh, you know, under their algorithms, 
But we have a general sense of the main factors that will affect your credit score. Um, the, the, one of the biggest factors is your payment history. The more on-time payments you make on your credit accounts, the better. So um, that's the best way to uh, increase your credit score is to have uh, open credit accounts that you're making on-time payments on with no negative history. Um, the amounts that you owe also will impact. And so, and what I mean by that is, it's also called utilization, but basically, <clears throat> you know, if you add up all your credit accounts, you're gonna have a certain amount of credit, line, you know, dollar amount available to you. It could be 20,000, it could be 30,000 or more. And the idea is to try not to use more than 30% of your available credit. Um, when you do that, um, your score will be better. If you're using more than 30% of the credit that's available to you, that will negatively impact your score. So even though you have like, let's say this $10,000 credit card, you wanna try not to um, you know, spend <clears throat> more than, than 3,000 a month and try to pay that off every month. Um, that, that's the best way to keep your credit score better. Um, length of credit history will also impact your credit score. So the longer your credit history, the better. So if, you, if you've had a credit card for 15 years, um, you wanna keep that open um, because if that's your oldest credit card and you close it, then your credit history is gonna shrink down to the next longest credit card. That might only be eight years or seven years. And so that will negatively impact your score. Sometimes people want to um, understandably close their unused accounts because they're not using them. Maybe they're paying an annual fee, but it might be worth it to keep it open, especially if it's uh, an older account because that length of credit history will improve your, will keep your credit score high, higher, you know, than if you close that account. If you close that account, your credit score will, will go down a bit. The types of credit that you use will also impact your credit score in, in the sense of you want to diversify and have a, a variety of different credit sources, um, a range of, of different types of credit. That means like in addition to credit cards, auto loans, personal loans, mortgages, um, student loans. If you have a variety of, of credit sources, that's a positive for your credit score. And um, new credit will also in increase your available credit. So when you get new credit, you know, if you apply for a credit card and get that, then that's going to add to your available credit, like the total amount. It might go, your total amount of credit available might go from 10,000 to 15,000. Th those kind of increases will also um, positively impact your credit score. But the flip side to that is you don't want to open up too many new accounts at once because those hard inquiries, uh, as I mentioned before, will have a negative impact. So um, bottom line is that the credit scores will vary depending on what kind of scoring model is used, but these are the main factors that we're aware of. Um, if you apply for a loan or credit and, and you're, giving, you're giving codes back to you explaining your score, there are code explanations available at this website called www.reasoncode.org. That's one source where you can get further detail on um, the different uh, factors impacting your, your particular score. And as I mentioned uh, before, the, the credit score itself um, is, is determined based on a proprietary algorithm that we don't have access to. Um, and, it, and there are three major uh, credit reporting bureaus, TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian. And each of them may use a different algorithm. Um, they tended to use FICO in the past. Some are using Vantage. So I think it just depends on when uh, you get your credit report. But they will generally generate a score that's between 500 and 850. I think I might have said up to 800 before. It should be up to 850. And you can see the range here. If you're, if you're above 700, um, you have pretty good credit. And you should uh, qualify for um, you know many of the credit accounts that you're applying for with a decent interest rate. Um, if you're below 660, you're in the fair to poor to very poor territory. 
um, and you may not qualify or you may qualify, but with a really high interest rate. And it might be worthwhile to try to improve your credit score and apply later to get a better interest rate if you don't need the credit right away. So this is this slide, I wanted to give an example of uh, what's called a trade line, which is basically just account information that appears on your credit report. Um, when you get your credit report, um, you will probably first see the names that are associated with, with your social security number and identity. You'll see addresses, phone numbers, and past employers. You definitely wanna check those, and make sure those are accurate, and if not, dispute them, and we'll talk about how to do that later. But the main part of your credit report is going to be a series of trade lines that goes account by account, starting usually with your open accounts and then closed accounts. And it will tell you um, who the account is with, what the balance is, what the status is, um, what type of account it is, and it will give you the credit history, which is just a month by month a uh, picture of um, whether you paid on time, what the payment was, and what the balance was. And so on the right side of this um, slide, we have an example here, kind of a dated example. It's back from uh, about 10 years ago. But just to go over the highlighted parts, the kind of the, some of the key things you would look for, um, you see the first highlighted thing here is that this is an account with Littletown Bank. You want to identify who the account is with. Um, the balance here is $14,285, so you want to identify that. And then the pay, the status, um, this says 30 days past due, so that's important because you want to know if you're past due because that's impacting your credit score. And if we go down to the bottom, the account type here, this is an automobile loan, and it tells you the last payment was made on July 5th, 2013. And then you want to go down uh, to this detailed month by month report. Um, we'll kind of start at the right hand side. So, so this and this could go back, you know, seven years basically. But um, this this first entry here that we see here is March fifth, twenty thirteen. You know, you'll see the balance at that time, what the scheduled payment was, how much was paid past due amount, zero, because they're paying on time, they're paying the amount due. And then the rating. Now, this is kind of probably one of the most important pieces of information to look at in your credit report. It may appear differently in different reports. So Experian, the way it reports the rating may be different from Equifax. It may be different from TransUnion. But you'll generally see like a, a check mark or like a yes, or in this instance, OK. And that means that this was paid. So, so March 5th, 2013, okay. April 5th, 2013, okay. And then on and on. You see um, here five consecutive months of on-time payments. That's all very good for your credit score. And that's what uh, potential creditors want to see, a history of on-time payments with no problem. But then you get to August 5th, 2013, and there's a 30 rating and that means 30 days late. So that means that this payment was missed. And that's, see the red circle that I put there, that's going to be a negative on your credit report. And then if you miss again, the next month, it'll be 60 and then 90 and then 120. So each of those missed payments is going to be a ding or a negative on your credit report. So you definitely want to check your credit reports to see if that's being reported accurately. If it's not, um, you can dispute it. But if it is, um, you can try to fix it um, in, in the sense of try to get yourself back on track or find ways to get that account back on track so you don't uh, incur um, consecutive, whoops, consecutive negative payments. So um, this is just one example of a trade line. So the, your credit accounts will generally look like this. Um, if it's a collection account, it'll appear a little bit differently. Um, the account type should say collection, and it should show you who the original creditor was. You may get an, an, a debt collection account that from ABC Debt Collection Company. You don't know who they are. You never heard of them. 
um, maybe they sent you a letter, but you didn't pay attention to it, or maybe they never sent you a letter. But um, so, but to figure out, well, do I, did I really even have an account that ABC debt collector is trying to collect on? You want to go down to the account type and see what type of account it was. It'll say collection. And then for collection accounts, it should have a line that says original creditor. And original creditor will tell you who that account initially was with and who this debt collector is trying to collect on behalf of, whether it was a, a credit card account. Uh, it could that In that instance, it could be a non-credit account. Utilities can go into collection and they will show up on your credit report. And then you want to figure out a way, uh, first of all, to verify that it's accurate. And if it's not, um, you know, to try to correct it or challenge it. Um, so the, it's kind of the main uh, things to look for when you're looking at your credit report. It takes a lot of uh, practice and patience. The credit reports are not um, uh, always in, intuitive or easy or user-friendly. And so that's why organizations like myself, or uh, not myself personally, but uh, my organization, Housing and Economic Rights Advocates, we're available um, uh, nonprofit legal services uh, that for no charge, we can provide. We can review your credit report with you and provide you um, input and feedback on it, and, and interpretation on what it means and what you might be able to do to either correct it or uh, do things to improve your credit. Um, there are also um, De U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development um, approves housing and credit counseling agencies, and if you search online, you can look for, um, that's HUD is short for Housing and Urban Development, and you can search for HUD approved agencies that um, are, you know, nonprofits and reputable and can provide credit counseling generally at no cost as well. You generally do not want to pay for these kind of services because they are available for free, such as with my organization and HUD approved uh, counseling agencies. This is how you access your credit report uh, for free um, from a website called annualcreditreport.com. You could do it online. This is a screenshot of the website. It may not look exactly like this today, but annualcreditreport.com is the only place that you can get your credit reports for free as authorized by federal law. And during the pandemic, you're able to do that weekly. Normally, you're only able to do that once a year, but if you have access to the internet, you can log in and it'll take you through a secure website and, and verify that you are you, you know, with your information and with questions that only you would know the answer to. And once you get through that, you'll have access to your credit reports and you can download and print them um, uh, for, your, for your records and then you can review them. If you don't have access to the internet, um, there is a form that you can use to request uh, the credit reports by mail. Um, if you, you know, if that's downloadable from the website, if you have somebody that can download it for you at annualcreditreport.com. But if you don't, um, you can certainly reach out to us and we could mail you the form or help you uh, access that. Now, just as a note, some people don't have social security numbers. They have taxpayer ID numbers. And for those folks, they have to request by mail. They cannot request their credit reports um, online at, on the website. So as I mentioned, you wanna get your credit reports and review them and see if there's any errors, if there's any inaccurate information. Because if there is, the credit reporting agency and the furnisher, which is the, the credit company that reported the information, have a duty to investigate and correct uh, any verifiable errors. Common credit reporting errors that we see include, um, include uh, the name, address, and phone number, and uh, or the employer not being yours. Sometimes people have uh, common names and they get mixed up with other people's names and then the addresses and the phone numbers get mixed up. So if, if you're Joe Smith, or Maria Martinez, very common names. You may have people with the same name. You may have their information um, on the um, on your credit report. 
and you, you don't want that to stay there because that's not yours. Um, and you don't want their information somehow to get their identity to get mixed up with yours and, um, and, and then negatively impact you. So it's important to look for those. And if they're not yours, then you can ask that they be deleted. Um, accounts that aren't yours. Um, you, like, as I mentioned, you might see a collection account. You're not familiar with the name. You don't know who ABC Collection Company is. Well, before you dispute it, you want to check for the original creditor name to see if that might have been an account that you had and then now they're collecting on it. But if you don't recognize the collection company or the original creditor, then uh, you may uh, then you might want to dispute that because it might not be your account. And if you do that, you can send a debt validation letter that we'll talk about later, asking for information on the account, asking for them to validate or verify whose account is this, um, and, to, and then you can cross-check that information to see if it was actually your account or not. Um, all right, we're starting to get questions, so I think we'll look in the Q&A box here. And I see that um, Donald has raised his hand. Donald, if you could put your question in the Q&A box, that's how we're um, handling questions here. I'm just gonna take a few questions at this point. Um, I have a, here's a question. I have attempted to remove a negative on my account for years. Nissan said I did not pay off a lease when I turned it in for a new lease. I've gone to them and they said they sent my account, they, they sent to my accounts, but it has not happened. What to do? Um, I, I'd say at this point, since you've tried on your own without um, success, um, to no fault of your own, um, why don't you reach out to Hera and our information will be at the end of the uh, the uh, presentation and we can actually one-on-one -on -one, um, provide you with a consultation and maybe help you try to take resolve this issue. Donald asks, what about if no fault of the credit card holder, the bank wanted to close the account because of possible fraud by a company or person other than the card holder? How does this affect credit when an account is closed but continued with a different account number? Um, I've had this happen to me, and unfortunately, it seems the way that it's handled is that that does negatively impact your length of credit history because now you have you have an account that's been, you know, that was going back several years, and now it's closed. You have a different account number. It's basically the same account, but with a different account number. Um, and so, if you don't take any action on it, it does negatively impact your history. Um, because it's now you're you know you're showing a closed account and then a new account, and the credit reporting companies are not considering that to be the same account. Um, unfortunately, I I personally have not um, dealt with how to handle that. Um, even in my own situation, maybe maybe I should. Um, but in any case, I would say that you could still try to dispute it with the credit. Um, uh, a credit reporting dispute letter, and we're going to talk about how to do that pretty soon, and and basically explain um, to the credit reporting agencies and to the furnisher that hey, this is basically the same account, and I don't want my credit history being negatively impacted by that. And if there's a way to report that, um, and at a minimum, it will show that the account um, that there is a dispute related to the account, and it's something that you could explain. When you're applying for credit, you know, like for a loan, that this was basically the same account, but it was truncated because of this fraud that was not, not my fault. Um, but, you know, so that's that's one suggestion. There may be other ways to deal with it, but I would start with the dispute letter. And then you want to, you know, as we'll talk about later, attach documentation to your dispute letter to basically prove to the credit reporting agency that's showing, you know, that showing kind of like a closed account in an open account, that this was basically the same account and that your credit score should not be negatively impacted uh, by that. We have a, a question from Jay. Can you post that number code site, please? Um, and so the number code site was reasoncode.org. Um, th this presentation will be available to you and we can email it to you if you've sent us your email address um, at the end. And so you'll have it there, but it's basically Reason, R-E-A-S-O-N, code, C-O-D-E dot O-R-G. 
I applied for and am using a card to pay monthly bills and paying the card payment. How long will it take to get a score and does having no credit score appears negative? Well, first of all, if you don't have a credit score, um, you're, it's gonna be very hard to get credit. You're doing exactly the right thing by using the card and um, paying the monthly bills off every month. Each time you do that, your score is going up. So you've, you should have established a score at this point. Um, just to note, if you get your credit reports by themselves, that does not come with a score, unfortunately. Um, you would have to pay the companies, uh, the credit bureaus to, to provide the score. Each bureau has a certain charge for it. Um, so don't confuse a credit report that doesn't list a score as meaning you don't have a score. You do have a score if you have credit accounts that are being reported. It's just that you have to pay extra to get that score. Um, there are ways, and I'm not necessarily recommending them because it, they come, they're, they barrage you with advertisements and things, but like Credit Karma and Credit Sesame are free applications or services where you can access credit reports and they will show you generally two of the scores from two of the credit bureaus. That's one way to see it for free. Another way is if you have a credit card, sometimes they show you, they have like a an associated sort of credit wise or credit um, monitoring service that comes with the credit card if you have internet access. And that's another way they might show you one of the credit bureau scores. Um, I see a very long uh, message from um, Helen Cortez. And I think that's one that um, we will have to, it's it's long and involved and this is a general informational session. So what I'd like to do is, is take that and save that. And Fabiana, if you could um, save that for me and we could try to respond offline about that one. Got and it. if you, oh, Fabiana, go ahead. Oh, no, I, I just got it. I will reach out to Helen after this so we can follow up. Okay. And I see, um, and, and if you look in the chat box, Fabiana has put a link there to our website where you can reach us for one-on-one -on -one consultations and to set up an appointment as well as the reasoncode.org um, link. So um, back to common credit reporting errors. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned before, um, other people's information might appear on your report. That's called a mixed file. And those are things you want to, to try to correct. And then there's identity theft, which unfortunately is, is a growing problem. Someone else might open an account in your name without your authorization and use it. Or they might be using your credit card. They've gotten access to your credit card number. And so there's, there's a, there's an, there are extra steps to take to address that as well that we're going to talk about. Um, another common credit reporting error is that the account is timed out. So generally, um, what timed out meaning it's, it's too old. Um, the account is too old or the negative information is too old, but it's still being reported. So like if you had an account and you stopped making payments in 2013 and the account was closed, it should not be appearing on your credit report now. Um, and that's because generally negative reporting should be removed seven years after the delinquency. So, and that means, you know, if the account was brought current after the delinquency um, and you still have that account open, but the negative, the, the delinquency was more than seven years ago, that, you know, the 30 day, 60 day, 90 day missed payments, if that's more than seven years old, that should not be on your report, um, even though your account is still open. So you can, you know, again, all of these are things that you can dispute as we're gonna show you how to do. Um, if the account was never brought current, you fell behind in 2013, you never brought a current, it was probably closed, um, but it's still on your account. No, that should not be on your account. It's too old um, and it should be removed. Now, just one caveat, if the account was charged off by the credit card company or the lender and sent to collections, then the seven year time period does not start to run until basically 180 days or six months after your delinquency. So, um, and, and when I say charged off, I don't mean that you were forgiven or discharged from that debt. What I mean is that the lender or the credit card companies basically said, look, they haven't paid for four months where it's just not worth it for us to spend money trying to collect on it. 
we're going to take a tax write off. We're going to charge it off and we're going to give up on it basically. But it doesn't mean it's forgiven. Um, it, you know, they could still report it um, for seven years, basically uh, seven and a half years in this instance after you stop paying. Um, collection accounts should also be removed seven years after the delinquency on the original creditor account. So sometimes the collection account, it doesn't appear until, you know, it might appear like it might have appeared five years ago. But if your last payment, your delinquency was more than seven years ago, then that collection account, um, you know, shouldn't shouldn't appear there anymore because the, you have to go back to the original account and when that delinquency occurred. Civil judgments will stay on for seven years. So if you, you know, were sued on a debt and you um, they got a judgment against you, that'll stay on for seven years. Bankruptcies will stay on for 10 years. Um, and then another common reporting error is that the account doesn't accurately reflect the loan balance or payment status. You're actually current, but it's saying you're 60 days late. You've actually paid down this loan to $2,000 and it's saying you owe 5,000. Those are things that you can have corrected through the dispute uh, letter process. I'll just check the questions again, since this is a pretty dense area that we're talking about. Um, How is it that there's so many different rates with different banks and cards? It, it, it's hard to know. I mean, you know, it's, it depends, it could depend. You might have, one bank might be looking at one credit report with one company, which might have a different score than another credit reporting company for the same person. And in that case, if the lower the score, the higher the rate generally. But I, it's, it's hard to tell. I mean, some banks just have a different profit margin I, I, there is definitely a variation. I know from my own experience that I've been offered, you know, rates that range, you know, some are three or 4% higher than others. And it's, it just depends on the bank, but I just, in that instance, it, it, it that just shows that it pays to shop around and look for the best rate. Cause there might be a lower rate out there for the type of loan you're trying to get. Um, how does student loan debt impact all of this? So private student loan debt, is generally treated like any other uh, type of credit. It's a student loan, so it's a credit, and it will get reported. Federal student loan debt will also be reported. The difference is that federal student loans have a wider variety of options to deal with and, and to get you back on track. They have certain loan forgiveness programs. They, you know, based on income-driven repayment, you can lower your monthly payments. That's a whole, we could spend a whole hour on that, but I, I would just encourage you to um, look at the Department of Education's federal student aid website on income driven repayment and loan forgiveness programs um, because it's a very complicated area. But if it's a private student loan, um, it's generally treated like the debts, the credit accounts that we're talking about here. Will there be an upcoming workshop on student debt? We can certainly talk to Sac Law, Sacramento Law Library about doing that for sure. Um, oh, in fact, as Amrit points out, there will be one on July 31st that I didn't know about. So he uh, informed about that. And I'm seeing a couple of, um, you know, receiving a summons and um, major illness and its impact on bills. And I would just um, ask Faviana if you could um, save those answers. Those are going to require, um, you know, one-on-one -on -one attention. And we can get back to you um, folks that have put in those comments um, at a later time. But we, we will follow up with you as long as we have your email address or phone number. Okay, I'm going to get back to the presentation. Here's how to dispute errors on a credit report. Um, you want to tell, there's two big steps. You need to tell the credit reporting agency in writing, and then you need to tell the furnisher. So um, you send a letter to the credit reporting agency, and we're going to have, we're going to show a sample letter in the next slide, I think. But you need to report that, you need to report to them in writing what information you think is inaccurate and why it's inaccurate. So we generally recommend a letter that's sent by certified mail. 
with return receipt requested so that you can prove that they actually received uh, the letter and when they received it. And if you're gonna have documents that support your position, like maybe uh, canceled checks that show that you made the payments that are being showed as late, um, or a letter that closed an account that is still being reported as open, you don't wanna send the originals. You wanna keep those as, as proof because this may not be resolved on the first try and you need to have uh, that proof. So make copies of this kind of information and then in include it with your, with your letter. You have to identify the specific information that you're disputing. So if you have a copy of your credit report, you want to um, basically you could circle or highlight uh, on a copy, not the original, but a copy, the information you think is inaccurate. Um, and then you want to explain why you think it's inaccurate. And then you want to have all supporting documentation to support, you know, that um your position that it's inaccurate. And once you send that in and they receive it, the credit reporting agencies, I'm talking, you know, any credit reporting agency, but generally we're talking about TransUnion, Equifax, Experian, they have to conduct a reasonable investigation and they have to forward all of the relevant information to the furnisher, meaning the person, the company that reported the information within five days. Um, and the credit reporting agencies generally have 30 days to respond to your dispute letter. So you want to, you know, watch your mail and see what comes in and see if it resolves it. And then if it doesn't, you know, there's another step that we can talk about, but you might at that point want to reach out to us or a credit counseling agency, a nonprofit HUD approved credit counseling agency for support. Step two is you, in addition to, uh, Disputing with the credit reporting agency, you also want to dispute with the furnisher, meaning the company could be credit card or lender that provides the information about you to the credit reporting agency. Just again, in writing, and you want to let them know that you're disputing an item that they reported on your credit report. And if the, if the provider, if the furnisher continues to report the item that you disputed, to the credit reporting agency, it has to let the credit reporting agency know that you have disputed this. And if you're correct, if, if the information you dispute is found to be inaccurate or incomplete, the furnisher, the information provider has to tell the credit reporting agency to update or delete the item. And you can see a link here. This information is generally found at the Federal Trade Commission website. There's a link there. Um, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, CFPB, also has good information for consumers on how to dispute uh, credit reporting errors. But this is a general guide here as well. And here's a sample letter, um, like a template that you could use. So it's, you know, general letter, you're going to put your information and the date on top. You're going to send it, um, you know, you're going to have a separate letter for the credit reporting bureau, like it could be TransUnion or Equifax or Experian. Maybe it's on all three and you want to send separate letters to each one and then a separate letter to the furnisher. But it would all the letters would have the same basic information. You're writing to dispute information in your file. You've circled the items you dispute on the credit report and you're attaching a copy of, of that of those items. And then you want to explain. Um, why it's inaccurate. It, the item is inaccurate because, you know, and you explain why. Because I never opened this account. Uh, because I, um, I'm current on this account, but it's showing me it's 90 days late. You know, because my name was never, uh, uh, you know, Jack Haramio. My name is Joe Haramio. And then you request that the item be removed, or you could request another change, like it be corrected to have the correct information. And then you're like I mentioned before, you're gonna enclose copies um, uh, such as payment records, court documents. I had a client, for example, um, who uh, was, in, um, was incarcerated during the time accounts were allegedly opened you know, by him. So he could not have opened them. Um, and they were also opened from Southern California and he was located in Northern California. And so he had his incarceration records, his address, and then information he got from the credit card company that showed that the person that opened this was in Los Angeles County. 
and that was you know his supporting documentation so it just depends on on your issue but like you just want to show, have the information that contradicts what's being reported as proof that you know if it's available that it's um <laughs> incorrect sometimes you don't have any documentation and then you could still dispute it um you just need to have a, a you know a real thorough explanation of why you believe it's inaccurate and it it will trigger the duty to investigate and hopefully um, if it is inaccurate uh, be corrected by the credit reporting agency now if you're a victim of identity theft where someone opened an account in your name but it wasn't you and it wasn't authorized by you there's three other steps that you should take um, step one you should place a fraud alert with the credit reporting agencies um, report that you're a, a victim of identity theft, ask them to put a fraud alert on your credit file, and they can contact other two companies, like if it's you report to Experian, they're supposed to contact TransUnion and Equifax and let them know as well. And that will stay on your report for 90 days. And that will let um, any creditors know, who anybody who's getting a credit application in your name, they will see that there's a fraud alert. And that's a red flag to them that maybe the person applying for this loan in your name is not you. Um, and, and you should, the a number should be provided where they can contact you and then they can ask you, did you apply for this loan? Um, and an additional step beyond that is a credit freeze, which means nobody can access your credit report at all. And that's, you know, that's kind of an extreme step. Uh, it may not be what you wanna do if you yourself are applying for credit, because then you'll be locked out too until you remove that freeze. But um, a fraud alert uh, is generally well, you know, the first step. You can also get free credit reports when that happens um, from the uh, credit reporting agencies, even if you've already got your normal free credit report from annualcreditreport.com. So you could review those for any other identity theft. And then a very crucial step um, that you should always do is create an identity theft report and send it to the credit reporting agencies and creditors that are reporting the fraudulent account information, basically an, a dispute letter that includes this extra document to document the, the identity theft. And the way to do that is the Federal Trade Commission has uh, a user-friendly website, identitytheft.gov, um, and you can go on there and it'll walk you through step-by-step, step, you know, what account, uh, do you believe was created without your authorization? What type of account was it? Why do you believe it was created? And, and then you're without your authorization. And then, you know, under penalty of perjury, you're attesting, you're basically swearing that, that this is true and correct. That this, you did not authorize the creation of this account or this group of accounts. And then it, it creates an affidavit, which is like a sworn statement that becomes evidence. And you can print that out. You can save it. And then you can send it with your dispute letters to the credit reporting agencies and to the lender or credit card company uh, where this fraudulent account, account exists. Um, the other alternative to that is you can get a police report. Um, that's another way to do it. And that's considered like basically the same documentation. You're documenting with, uh, with facts in a sworn statement that you were a victim of identity theft. And then you send a copy of that identity theft report to the credit reporting agencies and the creditors, along with a, dis, a, a credit report dispute letter, um, and a copy of the credit reporting that shows, you know, circling the fraudulent account information. And we'll, I, there's more information on this, but before I get to that, you know, just as a note, always save copies of the letters um, that you send and, and keep a log of the dates. Like when you found that, you know, on June 1st, I found out about this visa card that I never opened. On June 3rd, I sent it, I created an identity theft report or I got a police report. On June 5th, I sent a letter to, you know, to the visa company saying that this was not mine with the identity theft report. Keep a log because you may need to turn back to that chronology later on. This is just a screenshot of the identity theft website of the Federal Trade Commission. It's very user-friendly. You just, you click the buttons, get started, and it walks you through everything. And then it creates this nice report 
that you will electronically sign. Uh, it's also available in Spanish, and there's a button in Espanol that you can click for um, people that uh, speak and read Spanish. I'm going to just pause and check the Q&A box. Um, please, okay, the law library will have a copy of the sample letter if you need it, um, and they can work you can work on the sample letter at the Sacramento Law Library uh, if you need help access, accessing that. Just a note from um, Amrit Sandhu at the, at the Law Library. Okay, so now we're gonna turn to steps that you can take to improve your credit report and credit score. So, you know, as we've talked about, review your credit report, get those reports and review them for accuracy. And when there's errors, dispute those errors as we've shown you how to do. Um, pay your bills on time because that will create that positive monthly on-time payment history. And the more on-time on -time payments, the better your score. Keep the amount of credit that you use low. Try to keep, you know, less than 30%. You don't utilize more than 30% of your available credit if you can if you can manage that. Keep your unused credit accounts open, as I mentioned before, even if you're not using them. Or you, know, you might wanna just use them for things that you're gonna buy anyways. Um, like if you have to pay a cable bill or a cell phone bill, or you need gas for your car, um, use, your, use this old credit card to, to, to pay it so you can keep it open and you know, keep that credit history lengthy. Diversify your credit sources, as we mentioned before. We haven't talked about medical debt, but um, that's a type of account that could go into collections. Generally, it's not going to appear on your credit report when you just owe the hospital and they're waiting for you to pay. But if it goes into collections, that will go on your credit report. And so there are ways to deal with that. Um, if you are at 350% of the federal, federal poverty level or less, you probably qualify and you should qualify for financial assistance from the hospital. And they should have advised you of that and offered um, what's called charity care. Um, many times they don't do that in violation of the law uh, it's never too late to try to apply for charity care. Uh, this often happens when people go into the emergency room and then later they get hit with a bill, you know, for thousands of dollars. They were not offered financial assistance or charity care. Well, when you get those bills, you should contact the hospital and ask uh, or, and or contact their financial office and ask for an application to apply for charity care and see if you can qualify for that. Even if it's in collections, they have to offer, if you qualify for charity care based on your income, they have to offer you a reasonable payment plan um, that's, that's you know, a certain percentage of, of your income to make it affordable. So that's always worth looking into, and that can uh, get rid of the collection reporting for, for that type of debt. Um, and if you have problems with that, it could be complicated. Again, you can contact uh, HERA, my organization for assistance. Um, if you have outstanding judgments and liens, you to try to develop a plan to take care of that. Sometimes you can resolve those for less than the amount that is owed. You can work out a payment plan, uh, or you can try to offer a good faith settlement um, of less than the amount uh, of the judgment. If you generally have a good payment history, generally make on-time payments, but this one month, you had an emergency and you couldn't make that credit card payment because you had to spend it on a hospital bill or on, on a car repair or something. Um, it's worthwhile to call up the credit card company and ask if they will just do a, a goodwill deletion for an unusual late payment. This is not, you know, I'm, I'm a good consumer. I generally don't miss my payments, but this one month I did because this, you know, emergency happened. Can, would you be able to, uh, delete that as a goodwill deletion from my, from my credit report, De delete the negative, just show it as on time. <laughs> and sometimes they'll do that. Um, you're not entitled to that, but it's worth a try. Um, if you're in collections and you're trying to work out a settlement, you, part of that settlement could be that you ask them not to report um, the negative credit history on the account 
in exchange for your payment to resolve the account to pay what they're trying to collect or some portion of that. And sometimes they will agree to that. Um, and just generally, if you have old debt or debt that's in collections, if you can try to find a way to pay that down, at least to reduce the balances, to show that you're actively trying to resolve it, <laughs> though that could improve your reporting, which in turn can improve your score. And then finally, we'll get a little more uh, into this. Um, you can use credit building products like unsecured credit cards, secured credit cards, and credit building loans. Now, unsecured credit cards are generally your regular credit cards that you apply for. But if you can't uh, qualify because of your credit score or negative credit history for an unsecured for a regular credit card, you can try to get a secured credit card or a credit building loan. And we're going to talk about that uh, in the next slide, I think. Yes, so a secured credit card is a type of credit card that requires depo a deposit of your money. So basically, you deposit a certain amount of money, like $500. You might have to pay um, some small uh, one-time setup fees or you know monthly fees. But basically, because you can't qualify for normal credit, you're kind of, you know, you're securing it, you're providing a collateral, basically, with the bank. And that money, that $500 will stay in the bank for six to 12 months. And that's basically your credit line. So you get to use your own money um, to use a credit card to, in, you know, to, to buy things and establish a credit history. So it's a, it's a way to let you use your own money um, which otherwise would just be a regular bank account and would not be reported. But as, with the secured credit card, it does get reported when you make those on-time payments. Um, so, it, so once you've established that, you've deposited your money, it works like a normal credit card. So you use that credit card. The idea is to make purchases with it every month. Try not to use more than 30% of the credit line. So if you've got $500 uh, dollars deposited, um, I guess you're not going to want to use more than uh, $150. I don't know if I did my math right, but no more than 30% of that $500. Um, yeah, I think it's five, $150. But you, you basically use it to pay things off that, um, that you normally would buy. Like I talked about before, you got you to pay your cell phone bill. You got to get groceries. You need to get gas. So use that secure credit card, you know, up to no more than 30% of your available credit of your deposit and then buy those things because you got to buy them anyways and then pay off that credit card at the end of the month and every month you do that you know month by month each month is a positive you know like a check marker okay 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 on your credit report then your credit score is going up and once you've done that for a certain time period generally six to 12 months you will get your deposit money back. And now that secured credit card becomes a regular credit card and you've got a credit line uh, with this bank. And so generally uh, many credit unions offer this. A credit union can often be uh, more consumer friendly than a, than a bank because the credit union is a nonprofit. Its mission is to help its members whereas a bank is for profit and their mission is to make money basically. So, um, but you know, your, your major banks and credit unions will offer this. And it is definitely a good way if you don't, if you can't uh, qualify for a regular credit card to start establishing and rebuilding uh, your credit. Um, before I turn to the next topic, just to mention, there are other products offered like credit building loans. And um, it's a generally the same concept uh, you know, where you're putting money in the bank and then you're, um, or actually you're, you set up a, it, it, it'll depend from bank or credit union, but you're basically setting up a plan to deposit money every month into an account. But because it's called a credit building loan, it will be reported as credit. So each time you make that minimum deposit into the bank every month for a period of a year or so, that is reported as a positive credit payment on that credit building loan. And then after that year time period is over, that money's yours and you may have it like a credit line uh, established and you will have that, you know, positive payment history. So that's something else you could look into. 
is a credit building loan. It's very similar to a secured credit card. The idea is you're using your own money to establish credit rather than borrowing it from somebody. Okay, um, can I check the Q and A box? We are um, we're coming past the hour, but I um, I want to keep going because we haven't touched on the second topic or you know the last topic, the debt collection topic, and I'm probably going to have to whiz a little bit through that due to time constraints. But um, just look, check in the questions. If I have a good rating, is this the time to close some of those old cards I don't use? I would say. Think hard about that, because as I mentioned before, when you have an old card, that helps your credit because that means that old card is, is giving you a longer length of credit history. So if you had a card for 15 years, um, it, I'd want to really seriously think about keeping that card open because that 15 years of credit history is a plus. It's improving your credit score. If you close that card, and your next oldest card is only five years, then your credit history goes from 15 years to five years. And that's going to make your credit score go down. So I think it's worthwhile to consider keeping the old cards open, um, maybe using them again. Uh, like I said, you, you have to buy groceries, you have to buy gas, you have to pay your cell phone bill. Maybe use it to pay those items because then you're keeping that credit history long and lengthy. And that is going to uh, help your credit score. And then thinking cards that are not that old and smaller credit amounts, um, Sears, et cetera. You know, I, it's it's a judgment call. I think is as long as it's not your oldest card, because the, your oldest card is 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 key. I mean, if if it's a smaller card, there might be pluses and minuses. I mean. If you close it, you're reducing the amount of credit that you have. And so the amount of credit you have is also a positive. So if it goes down, then that could be a negative. But then if you can qualify and apply for another card, that'll go up again. So it's sort of a judgment call. Um, it will temporarily have a negative impact by losing part of the, you know, that amount of credit that you have. But on the other hand, you know, I, I understand people's concerns about letting something sit there. Um, Maybe you're concerned about identity theft, or maybe you um, are incurring an annual fee and you want to reduce that expense. So it could be worthwhile. But again, I, I generally, my default advice is, is probably to try to keep your accounts open because of the amount of credit factor and the length of credit history factor. Okay, we're going to turn to debt collection. It's not going to be as lengthy as um, I'd hope just due to time constraints, but I, I, I'm going to probably run till 1.30 here just to be able to cover this. And if you if you have to jump off, that's fine, but I, I just wanted to get through this uh, material as well. Um, so one thing to understand about debt collection is there's different players, and you may not, um, when you get the debt collection letters or phone calls, it's important to identify who they are. Um, your original creditors are the people you open the account with, your, your Bank of America Visa card, um, your loan uh, you know, with, with Wells Fargo for uh, your personal loan or your auto loan with Toyota Financial. Um, <laughs> those are the people you had originally opened the account with. Now there are debt collectors when you fall behind and they don't wanna spend money going after you, they will often contract out with the debt collector the original creditor still owns the loan or the credit card, but the debt collector is the company that's sending you the letters, that's making the phone calls, trying to collect on behalf of the original creditor. Now, there's a third player involved that sometimes gets involved that's similar to a debt collector, but they're actually a debt buyer. They actually buy the debt from the, the original creditor. They usually buy thousands of accounts at a time. Uh, that are all, you know, past due and behind, and they pay pennies on the dollar for them. So they might might buy a thousand accounts that might be worth, you know, have a million dollars of past due payments. They may only be paying, you know, fifty thousand dollars for those. So really, you know, very small amount, um, and that makes a difference 
Because if you're dealing with a debt buyer as opposed to an original creditor or a debt collector collecting on behalf of an original creditor, you have a lot more leverage to try to either work something out or defend yourself if you um, actually get sued by them for not paying. So generally, you know, when you fall behind, there's there's a there's kind of a pattern that we see. Um, the the original creditor will charge off uh, the account, not meaning meaning that not that they've forgiven the debt, but they're they're just getting it off their books uh, and taking a tax deduction on it. And then um, if they don't hire a debt collector, they're going to sell that debt to a debt buyer who I as I mentioned, is buying thousands of these at a time for pennies on the dollar. The debt buyer then tries to collect with letters and phone calls. And if they're not successful, they are filing thousands upon thousands of lawsuits to collect on these debts. And when they file the lawsuit, they're banking on the consumer not responding because the consumer gets the summons and complaint. They don't know what it is. They might not know the debt buyer. Some people choose to ignore it. Other people don't know what to do. They can't afford a lawyer. Um, there's not a big incentive for private attorneys to take this on. Um, and so then uh, they, they miss their 30 day response date because they have to respond within 30 days of being served with the summons and complaint. And then the debt buyer gets a default judgment. Uh, and once they get that judgment, not only does it go on the credit report, but it also allows them to try to collect by garnishing wages or levying a bank account. So um, it's very important if it gets to the point of a lawsuit, if you receive a summons and complaint, um, seek legal help right away. Hera, our organization, helps people all the time uh, with these kinds of lawsuits. Uh, you want to contact us ASAP if you get served with papers, um, and we can help you try to respond within the 30 day deadline um, or tell you what your other options are. Because if you don't respond, the risk is you have that default judgment. And unless you're judgment proof, meaning that you don't have any collectible assets and your source of income is protected, like if you get social security or disability, unless you're in that category, if you're working, if you hit own property, um, if you have collectible assets, you're at risk. And so you want to try to avoid the default judgment if you're in that situation. Um, sometimes it happens, people get the default judgment and then they come to us for help. We could try to help you in that situation as well. It's a little more difficult, but you still have options in that situation, um, especially if your income is exempt from collection and you don't own property. But even if you do, we can help you try to work something out um, in that situation. Now, when you're dealing with a debt collector, um, there's certain tips that uh, that we, you know, want you to know. Definitely, if you're getting calls, don't give out your sensitive information. Don't give them your social security number. Don't give them bank account numbers. Um, they should, you, you know, that that could be a scam. It could be somebody trying to get your information um, by scaring you into believing that you owe this money. And if you don't give them this information, they're gonna collect on it. They cannot force you to pay anything unless they get that judgment. So you're gonna get plenty of notice in writing. You should never go off of what somebody tells you on the phone. And you should you know, write down that phone number, keep a log, um, and then you could you know, contact Hera if you have uh, concerns about that or if you want to deal with it. But you don't want to give out sensitive information. What you can do is you can verify um, what the account is and if it's yours or not, because it might not be yours, it might be a scam. You can ask for their uh, address and tell them that you're going to request verification of the debt in writing and you want the address. Um, and you want whatever identifier they have for you, they, they, what name do you have? What is the account number you have for this? Because I don't know what this account is. You get the information for them. They might not give you everything, but you ask for it. And then you send them the letter asking them to basically validate the debt or verify it. Keep records of things that they send you. Um, write down the dates, times, and notes of the phone calls. 
And but definitely do not ignore your mail. As I mentioned before, you, there's a 30 day deadline to respond to a lawsuit to a summons and complaint. So if you get a court document and you don't respond, you can get that default judgment against you. And that's when you're at risk of collection. So open your mail. If you get something, summons and complaint, that's a big red flag. You know, contact Hera. We can we can look at it and try to help you respond or get or advise you of your options. Now, if you're getting these annoying calls and notices and you know it's not your debt, you can ask them to stop contacting you um, and they have to stop contacting you, especially, you know, the, you want to do it in writing and then that trip, then they have to stop contacting you. Um, or if you only want them to contact you between certain hours or at a certain address or phone number, only in writing or through your attorney, you can request that and they have to comply with that um, to stop the harassment. They can't call you before 8 a.m. or 9 p.m. They can't, they're not supposed to harass you or threaten you. Um, if someone tells you that you could be criminally prosecuted, that is absolutely false. You cannot be criminally prosecuted for, uh, for debt, private debt. Um, they can't um, call your boss, friends, or neighbors. Um, they can't lie to you or demand more than you owe or add unauthorized fees. So there's, these are things that they're prohibited from doing. And if they're doing these and you want assistance in stopping them, you know, you can contact Hera or get other legal assistance. Now, when you have a debt buyer, there's a, there's a, a certain law in place in California called the Fair Debt Buying Practices Act um, for debt that was purchased January 1st, 2014 or later, which by now is most of what we're dealing with, they need to have specific information and evidence of your debt before they try to collect from you. They need to tell you in writing that you have a right to have this information and they have to give you copies of this information within 15 days if you request it or they have to stop collecting until they do. Um, they have to notify you that they won't sue you if the statute of limitations is passed, which is generally four years from the date of delinquency. And they have to notify you um, that they will not report the debt or the debt to the credit reporting agencies if it's more than seven years old. And if the initial contact is in a language other than English, um, all the mandatory communications that they're supposed to have with you has to be in the same language. So there's additional rights you have when you're dealing with a debt buyer. So if you want to dispute the claim, this is a form um, available. And I um, assume that the Sacramento Law Library will have this available as well if you needed to come in and have assistance in writing this kind of letter. But this is um, basically, you know, when you want to dispute a claim, you want to uh, send them a letter in writing and ask them to send you proof um, that they have, you know, that they uh, proof uh, documentation of the reason why they believe you owe them the debt. And then you can ask them to stop reporting it to the credit bureaus and stop collecting um, until they've uh, provided you uh, with that debt and you can dispute it. If it's, a, if it's um, also, if you're unsure, Maybe I had this account, maybe I didn't. I don't really recognize the name. They say the original creditor is Wells Fargo. I think I did have a, a visa with Wells Fargo or a MasterCard. So this is this is a sort of a, a different version of the letter that you can send. And if it's a debt buyer, you have the right to this information. If it's a debt collector, um, they, they don't have to provide all of it. But if you respond within 30 days of the first contact, they do have to provide um, the basic information to validate the debt. But you're going to ask them for these items. What, what is the money that you say I owe? What, is that, what was that money for? Basically, what was this an auto loan? Was it a student loan? How did you calculate this uh, amount? Um, copies of papers that's where I agreed to say that I, you know, where I agreed to pay this amount, whether it be a contract, um, or something of that nature, you know, the identity of the original creditor. So if it's a debt buyer and you don't recognize them, then they have to tell you, well, who did they get this account from? Proof that they own the debt or have the authority to assert the rights of the owner of the debt. 
what the debt balance was, a charge off, um, an explanation of um, of all the interest and fees post charge off, the date of the default or the date of the last payment, the name and address of the creditor at the time of charge off, and the name and last known address of the debtor, meaning the account holder. If it's you, then they would have your information. If it's somebody else that they're confusing for you, then they'd have to provide that information. And then you could tell it wasn't really your account. And then the names and addresses of all entities that purchased the debt after the charge off, including you. So this is an, a different form letter that you could send with this information. Of course, you'd want to have your name and address, their name and address, and the date. You don't you want to keep copies of this letter that you send so you have proof and send it certified mail so you have proof that it was uh, received. And then just to caution here about scams, there are a lot of companies out there that want to charge you money and they'll promise that they can reduce the amount that you owe or get rid of the account or get rid of the credit reporting. Num numerous investigations have shown that these promises are false and they carry big risks. Um, you're gonna, they ask you to pay them instead of your credit cards and then they'll deal with the credit cards, but then they keep the money um, they usually tell you to stop paying your credit card bills because they're going to deal with them for you. But then if they can't resolve them for you, you're going to get late fees, you're going to get interest added on, and then they're going to start trying to collect on you, um, the, you know, the accounts or the debt collectors. And um, if you fall behind, they don't have to reduce your debt. There's no right to get debt reduction from in that way of dealing with it. It's going to hurt your credit score. And then if you get sued on it, they're not going to, the, these debt settlement companies um, are not going to help you. Um, you're going to get stuck. So generally, um, the alternative to this is seeking assistance from a nonprofit head approved counseling agency or a legal services organization such as HERA instead. And you can usually get these services for free. HERA provides them for free. Um, now, sir, we don't provide debt settlement per se, but we provide you with advice on how to deal with, with your debts. Now, there are head approved counseling agencies that can help you get on a debt management plan that's a little, you know, more specific um, and tailored uh, to, to, your, uh, to your needs. And, and that also generally is provided for free. So that you want to definitely seek out nonprofits, head approved counseling agencies or legal services organizations rather than these for-profit debt settlement companies or debt consolidation companies. I'm going to check the Q&A box. We're coming to a close here. Um, and just a note from um, Amrit at, at the Law Library, let folks know um, they can help folks understand if they're receiving mail from a debt buyer and have resources on different ways they can choose to respond. So the Sacramento Law Library is available to help with that as well. Um, debt, another note, debt buyers will also buy debts that are over seven years old. I had it happen to me. I checked them about their practice and never heard from them again. That was great that you caught them on that and you called them on it. Um, they, they do have to advise when they're trying to seek on time, um, on, on time bar debt, um, and they're not supposed to report debt that's seven years old. They have to give you a notice you know, we cannot, basically it says that, you know, this debt is past the statute of limitations and we cannot sue you on it. But sometimes they don't, especially if they're unscrupulous. And so you definitely want to be on the watch for that and try to figure out, even if it is your debt, well, when was it incurred? Um, and again, uh, you have resources available to help you with that, like the Sacramento Law Library and HERA and HUD approved counseling agencies. All right. Thank you for your patience. We did go over here. Um, I'll just pause and see if there's any last minute questions before I close. So now's your chance. Okay. I'm seeing none. Um, thank you so much for attending this. Um, and thank you, Emreet, and uh, for, for uh, collaborating with us in the Sacramento Law Library. Here is a slide of resources. Um, the Sacramento Public Law Library can help you find legal research materials for free that can help you understand your options. Um, there's the address 609 9th Street in Sacramento or a law library in your own county. 
and the Sacramento uh, County Public Law Library can help you find your own local public library if you're not in Sacramento County. And they have online materials at saclaw.org and there's an email and phone number available. And um, also to note that um, you can, you, if you wanna talk to a lawyer for one-on-one -on -one consultation, you can contact Hera and we can provide advice um, on these issues as well as housing, estate planning and other consumer related issues. Just to note, um, you know, generally we provide free consultations on these issues. If we actually help you with the state planning, that is the only service that we would charge for, and that's on a sliding scale. But everything else is, is a free consultation. And if we see a way that we can help you more directly, we will um, offer that as well for free. Um, and our website is www.harrisca.org, as it says there. You can email us at inquiries at harrisca.org or call us at 510-271-8443, extension 300. Um, Faviana has placed a, a survey that we would like you to, uh, to take in the chat box, a survey monkey survey. Please take the brief survey. It really helps us uh, to know um, what we can do better, what we've done well, what needs improvement, and how we can best do these workshops in the future. And again, Really appreciate uh, your help and collaboration with uh, with this Sacramento County Public Law Library and Amrit. And um, thank you, Fabiana, for, um, for your uh, assistance with this workshop. And with that, um, thank you all for attending and wish you the best of luck in, um, in your endeavors and uh, working you know, with, uh, with your credit and your debt issues. And don't hesitate to contact us uh, if you need help or feedback on those as well.